Our reading this morning is taken from Luke 17, verses 5 to 10, and you can find it in page 1051 of the Church Bibles. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, you should say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends, just before the sad news of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's death, the national news was dominated by the ongoing cost of living crisis and especially by the significant increases in energy costs that have already come into effect and others which are planned for later this year. The way you opened up your churches and your church halls as centres of prayer and meeting during the period of mourning is a testament to the church's place as servants of the communities in which they're set. I want to thank you again for all that you did. But now, as the weather turns colder, we may again be called upon to provide other ways to express living God's love by providing warm, welcome spaces. We will need to do this by working with other local community groups, churches and councils to ensure that every community has a warm place for people to be. While the new energy cap on the unit price of energy will lessen the impact on households this coming winter, for many people the cost will still be far too high and they'll be an impossible situation. The Warm Welcome campaign has been set up to coordinate offers of volunteers and warm buildings and I want to encourage every PCC to discuss how we might respond. But of course, at the same time, we are in no way exempt from the pressures of greater than expected fuel bills this coming winter. Work is going on at this very moment to confirm that churches will qualify for a capped tariff. And as you can imagine, I'm engaged politically through my role in the House of Lords to see what additional support can be given to those churches and charities which are providing warm hubs. The finance staff at Hollywell Lodge and the board for mission and ministry are working together and hope to be able to offer modest grants to those churches which want to run warm hubs. We're also in close conversation with the National Church to see if any additional financial relief can be made available. But there are several practical things we can all do. I've asked the team at Hollywell Lodge to prepare some easy-to-follow advice around choosing an energy supplier and the more efficient use of our buildings. This advice will be sent to parish clergy and church wardens and we'll make it available on the diocesan website. And then finally, and on something of a personal note, I recognise there'll be some of us who will be in the fortunate position that we don't actually need the winter fuel allowance which the government is providing. I've already decided that I'm going to donate this amount to a new diocesan fund to supply short-term financial assistance to places most in need due to their fuel bills. If you happen to be in a similar fortunate position to me, I'd ask you if you'd consider also donating either to this new diocesan fund or to your local church, or to a charity. Please will you join me in prayer as we plan and as we pray for the winter months ahead and seek ways in which we can work for the flourishing and thriving of our communities. And so thank you 
for all that you've already done and are doing and all that you might be able to do as we're looking to get through the challenges of this winter together. Thank you. Father God, we just uh, pray for Tim this morning as he brings your word to us. And we say again that may our hearts be open to mm. receive the message you give to us today. May your Holy Spirit just be with him throughout. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Wendy. Well, that video was released by Bishop Allen this week and asked to be shared across churches, um, across our diocese this weekend. Um, just to serve as a reminder that even though we've been in that period of national mourning, that all the things that were happening before that are still happening now. And it seems to me that this last week we've lived through has been yet another chaotic and strange week. We've seen the markets in absolute turmoil this week over the government's plans. We've seen Russia carrying out sham referendums and illegally annexing parts of the Ukraine. It's been a colder than normal for this time of year, and the energy cap went up yesterday. There's been so much that's been going on. That's just to name a few. There's even something as silly as this morning. I was looking on my Google News feed. The top headline was, we are facing nuclear annihilation. People in Ukraine that are seriously thinking that because the new people that Russia have put in place are saying, we need to bomb them with nuclear bombs because they've taken this over. To the next headline, which was the most ridiculous, that people are losing sleep over a change in the menu at McDonald's. It's ridiculous. People are apparently losing sleep because McDonald's are starting to do Happy Meals, but only in the US and not in the UK. You've also got the ridiculous. There are over 67,000 people that have signed a petition to say that Holly and Phil should be removed from leading this morning because they queue jumped. If pe that many people are complaining about that, we've got our priorities seriously, seriously wrong. It feels like a very unsettling time at the moment for so many different reasons. These last couple of years, we've got to this point, and then COVID has reared its ugly head again, and we've had to change our, our thinking and our planning at the last minute. I hope and pray that doesn't happen again. We need to be moving on. We need to start getting our priorities right. We need to start speaking out as the church with a voice. As Bishop Allen says, we are servants of the community. We need to be speaking out into our community and saying we are here. And, I, and the PCC will be discussing what he talked about, about becoming a warm welcome hub over the winter. Uh, to see if we can support our community that way. I've already been in discussions with the hub about whether we could do something um, so there is something open every day, whether the hub can be open, we can be open, but watch this space. The PCC are meeting a week tomorrow, and we'll, we'll update you after that. Yet in amongst all of that uncertainty, all of that stuff that's going on nationally and globally, things are continuing to happen on a local level. We're already busy planning for Christmas services. Yes, already. In fact, we're a little bit behind because normally they should be done by September. But we're planning Christmas services. The Christmas card is almost ready to go, subject to PCC approval. We've had a fantastic response to that collection outside church yesterday. If you were looking at the slides at the start, I forgot to put a number in, but I think it was 12 crates for the food bank and about five or six bags full for the hygiene bank. We're looking forward to celebrating Harvest next weekend with our barn dance on Saturday night, and do invite people to that. It's just something that we're putting on. People have said to me so, for so long, we want more social events at church, so we've put a social event on, yet only 17 tickets have been sold. Who can you invite to that barn dance so that next week we've got 60, 70 people in here? Wouldn't that be amazing? And of course, then next week, next Sunday, we're celebrating our community harvest service. We were hoping to have the school choir here, but they can't make it. But nevertheless, we will still have a celebration as we thank God for the harvest. Earlier this week, I was up at St. Thomas's Stopsley and was on their live stream prayer and share before a meeting I had with David. And he reminded the listeners of that, and the, well, I should say the watchers or the viewers, and me, that we have that wonderful link with St. Thomas's. That, of course, they were involved in the planting of the church here in Bushmead. I talked to David about working together on a few things over the coming months. And it reminded me in that conversation how easy it is for us to put our blinkers on and only think about what we are doing and forget that we are part of, a ch of the church of God. We tend to think, well, we're doing this at Christ. We're going to do this and this alone. We forget that we're part of a much wider church and the body of Christ. Indeed, Amanda and I yesterday attended a prayer breakfast 
for church leaders in Luton. And it was wonderful to hear the stories of what God is doing across the town. And actually, we were there, and we were saying, we're not in this to compete with each other. We're not trying to say, well, you're doing that, well, we want to do it better. We're trying to say, well, like St. Hughes are running a worship academy. Well, if you're doing that, how can we support you? If we're going to be a warm hub for Bushmeet, how can others support us? And I think we need to start getting that conversation right and start looking at how we can support each other rather than competing with each other. We all know that when we start comparing or competing, it's the devil that gets in. The worst thing we can do is start comparing ourselves to the person sat next to us. Also this week, I received a letter from friends of mine down in Plymouth who told me about a project that I set up back in 2012 and how it has gone from strength to strength. Because this week, it's been relaunched as well, that it's been so successful. Now, I'm not sharing this with you to build myself up, to say, actually, this is something that I did, and look how great it is 10 years later. But actually, I'm sharing it because I want to share the story behind how that happened. Because the project began when Martin, who was the lead chaplain at the time, and I, we saw potential for unused space within the Navy chaplaincy building. I might have shared this story before, but there were two rooms downstairs that were empty, that were unused. One was probably about half the size of this room, and the other one will have been about a quarter of the size of it. And we said, well, actually, what can we do with these rooms that could be used for the benefit of the sailors on the base? So we decided to create something. We decided to be cheeky and went and asked all the different people on the base who had money if they would give us money towards this project. Surprise, surprise, they did. And I went out and spent £7,000 on a government credit card one morning, probably never to be repeated again. But we, did, we, got, we, we asked people, and they would said, yeah, we can get behind that, we can support you. And then in early 2013, in the chaplaincy centre at HMS Drake, the haven was born. It started off small. It started off with just that small room. This week, they've relaunched with the small room, the large room. They've got so many different things happening day in, day out. They've also employed more people to look after the haven. They now have three people who are full-time looking after that haven. I was on my own when it started, that project. They do bacon butties. They do games nights. They do all sorts of things to encourage people to come in. And as an aside, the important part of that haven is obviously with the Navy being such a hierarchical structure, as soon as you walk through those doors, you're known by your first name and your first name alone. No uniforms, no name, no, 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 no rank, just names. It's amazing to see how that has developed over the 10 years. I mean, I left there in July 2013. But it's amazing to see that that has developed from an idea that two people had after lots of prayer that two of us had and to see how that has developed. Sometimes it serves as a reminder to me that sometimes the little things we do now, we're not going to see what's going to happen 10, 20 years from now. The things that we do right now as Christ Church, we might not realize that in 10, 20 years will have a significant impact. The vision that we launched last month, it may be actually, well, this is what we're going to do now, but in 20 years we might look back and go, well, that's when we started this, and look what's happened. Look at the, how fruitful that has been. It reminded me, all of this reminded me that sometimes we have to act with faith. I had no idea that converting that one small room in a chaplaincy building in Plymouth would have had a continuing impact over these last 10 years. And clearly there's many more years to come as it's been relaunched with more people and more activities. We step out in faith and trust in the Lord when he's called us to do something. I then started wondering, well, why did it succeed well, it was something that the Lord wanted to happen. And we felt called to offer something different. We had a vision on what we felt the Lord was asking of us. The Lord provided for us when we began. He's been providing for the haven ever since. At Christ Church, we have our vision. We have our building blocks in place. And I wonder what will be said from the front here in nine or ten years' time. Will the story be going out about what we did in 2022? Will the vision, or will the vision that we have launched be long forgotten? Will it just be gathering dust somewhere in the corner? Will something else have happened, then something else, and something else, and will have just forgotten about it? Or will we have seen that vision grow and develop and become fruitful for the kingdom of God? And I hope and pray it's the latter. The vision will enable us to move forward as we all come to work together under it. It will enable us to see ways forward within the church that perhaps otherwise we might have missed. In the same way that Martin and I saw the empty space in the chaplaincy, 
and this became something in its own right. Here in Christchurch, what can we see that can develop and get behind to further the mission of the church and to reach out to the local people of Bushmead? Today is the day when we are launching our gift day appeal for this year. I wondered if that's why so few people had turned up, because at 25 past 10 it looked quite empty. And normally people, just, people don't come when it's a gift day. Or people, you'll now switch off and think, oh, we're talking about money, we're going to switch off. But I want to encourage you to continue listening, if you can bear my voice for another 10, 15 minutes. But we're launching, the, launching our gift day appeal. And not ask, we're not asking for money today. And remember, the gift day is not just about money and what is given. It's a day when we can celebrate the gift that we all have and that we can all celebrate what God has given us and what he will continue to give us. Today is a chance not to go, okay, well, I'm going to give this much. Today is a chance to think, can I even afford to give anything? Because I know, friends, that as Bishop Allen says, and as we know ourselves, times are tough. I know that for those, some of us, that energy prices will have shot up yesterday. And Amanda and I are having to think, can, how often can we have our heating on? You know, we've got to think, and I've got to be realistic with this. We, we acknowledge that it is a difficult time. But it's about asking the Lord and saying, what do you want me to contribute? What do you, how can I offer? What can I offer to Christ church? And it's not necessarily only gifts of money. I want to be really clear on that. The first thing we do is we need to seek the Lord because he is a generous God. We've received many blessings from him, but we seek him first. And that's the important thing. This year, the PCC and I are going to be putting any funds raised to the gift day towards refurbishing that disabled toilet downstairs because it looks awful. I know it's, it's looking tired. It needs to be sorted. And it might not sound like a missional objective. Oh, we're changing the toilet. Why? Well, friends, if we're going to be inviting people into this building, if we're going to be encouraging our community to use it more, then we need to look like we care for the building. I'm not saying it doesn't look like we don't care for the loo at all. I know Steve has done a great job in look, you know, looking after it and cleaning it and making sure it's clean. But we want to look good. The meeting place has meant we're open on Mondays. We're starting to get more and more people in each week. We want to have some comfy seats outside for them to sit on rather than those metal chairs. Unless it's just me, but I don't find them very comfortable. But we want to start getting to a place where we look welcoming. Too often I've been here in a week and people have come in and gone, oh, are you a church? I thought you were the doctors. Seriously, somebody has come in and asked if we were the doctor's surgery. People have come in and said, oh, are you just a community center? Because we look, it looks a bit tired. We're 20 years old this year. Let's celebrate. And that, and even though it might sound mundane, it is a missional objective if we are going to be inviting people into this building. By making our building suitable, it enables, it enables us to go out and reach into the community. As I say, I'm well aware that at the moment it's very difficult for us all. But I want to see if this church can become a warm hub over the winter to support those who might struggle with heating. I've also, this week, again, been in conversations about offering uh, families a Christmas lunch around Christmas time. I was at the sixth form on Monday, and Altaf called me and said, what do you think? Could we do something? What do you think? And I was like, well, actually, there will be people that are struggling. Could we support that? If we look beyond everything that is happening, that the media tells us is happening, there are lots of initiatives happening within the local community to support people in the local community. As I was talking to Altaf, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could have those people that perhaps couldn't afford to put lunch on their table? They could come, probably not here, but they could go, but we were thinking, to the sixth form, have a meal. The sixth form have a 220-seater theater. And we said we could have a meal. They could go next door, watch a film, and have popcorn, and they could do it for free if the community got behind it. Wouldn't that be amazing? It's one of those ideas that's just germinating at the moment. I'm just sharing it with you for prayer. But in the reading, the disciples ask Jesus to increase their faith. Jesus responds by saying, even faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. If we look at the situation in our nation and in our world, it would be easy to think that there is nothing we can do. Yet with faith, we know that anything is possible. And it is important that we are prepared for responding to Jesus when the call comes. Have we got faith to believe that anything is possible, that things will happen? 
Have we got faith to believe that there will be peace in Ukraine? Have we got faith to believe that the markets will settle down? Have we faith to believe that we will get through the winter supporting one another, no matter how difficult it gets? Going back to the breakfast I was at yesterday morning, uh, Vincent Cox was speaking, and he reminded us about the character of God. He posed the question, what do people need to know in Luton that they don't already know? The answer, he said, was the character of God. He then said, what do Christians in Luton need to know that they don't already know? Guess what the answer was? The character of God. In many ways, friends, we've left behind the character of God. We've made him into something that fits into our own beliefs and our values rather than us shaping ourselves around him. This church is based on Scripture. We won't deviate from the teachings of Scripture. We're Holy Spirit-led, and we want to reflect the character of God in all that we do. As Jesus says to his disciples, don't expect things to happen if you are not prepared to work. That comes slightly later in in the reading we had this morning. Essentially, what the reading comes down to is the servant in the field is not immediately invited to eat with the master when he comes in. The servant is the one who obeys and does what is asked and at the end simply says, I have done my duty. The servant is not there to build themselves up, to get themselves known by everyone or to become famous. The servant is there to get on with the job at hand and is doing what is simply asked of them to do. And I believe that that is a crucial lesson for the church today, that we too just need to get on with the job that the Lord has asked of us, not to seek to be famous through our faith, not to seek to boast about all that we're doing in the church, but to simply do the job that we have been called to do. If we want our faith to be increased, that is the mindset that we need to switch to. We need to stop asking God to fit into our plans, and we need to start fitting into his plans. I started by saying about all the things that have happened this week and how we can often feel despondent when looking at the news. I have to remind myself that as I look at the news This is not my home. This is not where we belong. We have our eternal home, and life is a journey towards that eternal home. Now, that's not to say I don't care about what's going on in the world, because I really do. I've already said it. I long for peace in Ukraine. I long for a just economic policy that won't see the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. I long for a society where everyone is valued and respected. And friends, none of that, it might sound like pie in the sky, but none of that is out of reach. If we have faith in the Lord, if we do what is asked of us, all of that can be possible. If the church as the army of God can mobilize themselves to have faith, to do what is asked of them, I truly believe that we can see transformation in this nation. God will provide Our gift day appeal is not about me standing here and asking you for money so we can refurbish our disabled toilet. It's not about me asking you for money if you're wondering how you will put food on the table or keep your house warm this winter. It is is me asking you to ask the Lord what he wants you to do. Gift day is so much more than a financial offering. I know some of us won't be able to give, and that's fine. I don't want anybody to feel guilty. Equally, I know there'll be some here who will be very generous with their gift. And to be clear, I don't know who you are. I don't know who gives what, and that's the right thing. I don't want to know. I know also, though, that there are people here who give their time and their energy to make sure this church runs. I know the countless hours that people will spend behind the scenes doing stuff that is not seen to make sure that we're ready for our services, to make sure that we're ready to do our outreach, to make sure that we're ready to stand outside for four hours and receive food donations from the community. And I want to celebrate that today. I want to celebrate who we are and where we've come in these three years since Amanda and I have been with you. As I come to a close, we're called to do our job. We're called to say, I've done my duty. Going back again to yesterday morning at the gathering of the leaders, we heard about the character of God and we were invited to look around the room and see the other church and parachurch leaders who had gathered there. We were reminded that God is doing a new thing, that God has not forgotten Luton, that Luton is very much a part of the kingdom of God. 
We were asked to stand and sing the chorus, He is Lord. And we were asked to sing that over Luton. And as we did, it brought tears to my eyes, thinking about how faithful the Lord has been, even in this church alone, in the last three years since we've been with you. So much has happened. And I know that even before we arrived, God was faithful and provided for this church. And I know that he will continue to be faithful and provide for this church. Why? Because, friends, we all have faith. We all go about, we do what is asked of us. And we say, I've done my duty. So I'm going to invite us to take some time now to pray to the Lord, to see what he is asking of you on this gift day. And then in a few moments, I'm going to invite us all to stand and to sing that chorus, He is Lord, over this church and over this community. Yesterday we sang it over Luton. Today I want to be more specific and sing that over Bushmead and the community that we serve here in our parish. We're merely doing our job and serving the Lord, whatever that looks like. But as we do so, let's pray that our faith is increased that we will be more aware of what the Lord is doing in the here and the now, that we'll be more aware of what the Lord is doing in this community, in our town, in the nation, and in the world, that we would switch our mindset from that negative stuff of what is happening to actually be able to say, this is what the Lord is doing, to switch from, well, I want to do this, Lord, will you bless it, to switch into, what do you want me to do, Lord? So we're going to take a few moments of silence just to pray now. And then I'm going to invite us to stand and sing, He is Lord, together over this church, over ourselves, and over our community. Let's pray. Father God, the disciples asked you to increase their faith. You replied by telling them to get on with the job that you have called them to do. Father, I pray that for those of us gathered in this church, would do just that, that we would get on with the job that you have called us to do. I pray for all those of us here who may be fearful of what this winter will hold, whether we've enough to heat our homes, to put food on our table. Pray for this church, that if it's right for us to become a warm hub, that you would make a way. And I pray for each of us as we reflect on this gift day, what is it that you are asking us to do? Are you asking us to give financially? Are you asking us to use a gift that you have given us? Are you asking us to give time? Are you asking us to step back? Father, would you speak to each of us now in a way that only you can do?